please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, as we continue our study of God's great work of redemption accomplished uh, under the direction of Moses. We'll be beginning in Exodus chapter 12 this evening, Exodus chapter 12. Please follow along as I read the first 14 verses of this chapter. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire." Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you. And you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Let us once again seek God's help as we come to his word tonight. Father, you have answered innumerable prayers over the many years that your people have sought your face. You've heard them and you've been pleased to answer them in gracious abundance. We would seek your face again tonight and ask that you would be merciful to us, having aided us in our worship of you. We would ask that you now help us as we seek to understand your word. Guide in the preaching of the word, guide in the understanding of the word, and in the application of it to each of our lives. We plead for your grace that we would not go astray either preacher or hearer, but we would follow you according to your will. Hear and answer our prayers as we seek your face in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We saw last time we were in the book of Exodus, the final announcement, the final warning given to Pharaoh 
the announcement made with those bold promises that a final plague was to come upon Egypt, which would result in Israel's deliverance. Now, we come to chap- as we come to chapter 12, we really need to understand something of the uh, unusual nature of what is about to be stated. Something of the surprising content. But to put ourselves, as it were, into Israelite sandals. And here we have been hearing from Moses, or it's been coming through the community, what Moses has been doing as he's been standing before Pharaoh, and as he and Aaron have been declaring the word of God to Pharaoh. And now we hear, after nine plagues have been announced, nine plagues have come, nine plagues have gone, now we hear announced to us, this is the last plague. And then the directives come to us. That on a particular day of the month, We are all to go out and take a lamb and we're to come into the house and slaughter the lamb. Later we'll learn it's supposed to be done by a knife. And that we're supposed to roast it whole, eat some of it, and sprinkle the blood on our doors. We've never done this before. God has not given us any directives up to this point that were necessary for us to accomplish in order to benefit from His care in the midst of the plagues. But now He's asking us to do something. And He's telling us it's a very significant event. An event which is so significant that the whole community's life is going to revolve, as it were, around this one event from now on. For notice He says that this month, that is when this sacrifice takes place, this month will be the beginning of months for you. It's as though we're to take the whole calendar and reorient ourselves to this event. We're to live in the light of this event as a community. And then it's going to require very detailed, clear instruction and detailed obedience to carry out exactly what he tells us to do. Now, Before I go any further in the exposition, we need to step back for a minute because I hope to deal with the entirety of chapter 12, which is, if you'll notice, 42, excuse me, 52 verses, or 51 verses. You know my track record with such things. We will come back to this chapter because there's no way I can cover all that's in here. But I want us to step back for a moment and look at the entirety of the chapter because it's really kind of a, a bizarre chapter when you're reading it. It's all chopped up. And if you've stopped to go back over it sometime and read it, you'll realize that there's a real mix of events, of things going on here. There is unrepeatable historical events in which God accomplished the redemption of Israel. And we have those set out in this chapter. Unrepeatable historical events in which God accomplished the redemption of Israel. But then mixed with that, interwoven with that, are repeatable memorial events by which Israel remembers God's redemption. And so we have history and ceremony being woven together. Notice with me, if you will, just to scan down through this, how this comes about. In verses 1 to 13, we have directives for the non-repeatable, the unrepeatable historical sacrifice. And then in verses 14 to 20, we have directives for the repeatable memorial ceremony. 
Then when we come to verses 21 and 23, there are directives to the elders to engage right now in this unrepeatable historical sacrifice. Then in verses 24 to 27, we go back to instruction regarding the repeatable memorial ceremony. And there's new information that's given. And then in verses 29 to 42, we come back to a description of the unrepeatable historical redemption. Actual historical facts are going to be given. And then in verses 43 to 49, we have instruction regarding the repeatable memorial ceremony. Now what I'm going to do this evening is we're just going to go straight down through this chapter. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. And I just want to look at, first of all, the unrepeatable historical ev- things that are mentioned, then the repeatable ceremonial events, then the unrepeatable historical and the repeatable ceremony, because I want you to see how Moses has woven these together for a purpose. We'll come to that, Lord willing, at the end. First of all, then, verses 1 to 13, directives for the unrepeatable historical sacrifice. There are directives for a specific day, directives for a once for all time historical sacrifice never to be repeated. It can't be. This sacrifice must take place in Egypt. Now notice what he says in verses 3 through 6. And I'm just going to highlight some things and we're going to make our way down. I'll just give you basic words from this. I want you just to kind of scan it with me. But the first thing that he does is he gives a directive to take a lamb. We see one, two, three, four, five times in just three verses, three through five, where he speaks of the lamb. It's a lamb which is to be sufficient, is specifically sized according to the family size. It matches the family exactly or as best as can be approximated. If, it, if the family's too small, then you're to get the neighbors and do it together. But it's a lamb which is sufficient for the members of the household. It is a lamb which is to be unblemished. It's a one-year-old lamb, the age of strength, it doesn't have, hasn't had time really to, in, to encounter many of the things which would blemish a lamb. It is to be set aside for four days and watched, observed carefully that it might be truly unblemished. There's a great deal of scrutiny. This lamb must be the right lamb for each household. And then that lamb is to be slain, is to be killed. Now, there's no reference at this point to any sacrifice being made. It is to be killed. It is to be slain for the household. It's actually to be slain for a meal. Now, before the meal takes place, we're supposed to do something kind of odd. You're supposed to take some of the blood, and they were to put it on the two doorposts on either side, and the lintels, not lentils, those are beans, the lintel that runs across the top. So you're supposed to smear the blood on the door. Then you are to eat the roasted flesh. Don't boil it. You'd have to break it in order to get it into the pot. You'd have to cut it up in order to get into the pot. It's to be kept whole. It is to be roasted by fire. Now the roasting by fire may be due to the fact that it requires no butchering. It requires, thus, thus it's quick and easy to eat and get prepared. It is to be eaten with unleavened bread. In other words, bread that you didn't have time to fully prepare and let it rise and punch it down and let it rise. It's to be eaten with bitter herbs. The bitter herbs, as some of the commentators point out, may also have something to do with the fact that you're to be doing this quickly. Although the word bitter, and certainly later in Jewish history, may have had reference to the bitter lifestyle that the Jews experienced, that the Israelites experienced in Egypt, this same word bitter is found in Exodus 1 and verse 14. The Egyptians made their lives bitter with hard labor. Same Hebrew word. So you're to take the lamb, 
You're to kill the lamb, spread the blood, and eat the roasted flesh. Now, in verses 10 to 11, we see very clearly that this is an unrepeatable event. So much so that if there's anything left for the next day, you're not even supposed to eat any more of it. You're supposed to burn anything that gets left over. So if you do miscalculate and it's a bit too big for your family, then you're supposed to burn everything in its entirety. And it's unrepeatable because you're supposed to eat this as though you're ready to go. You're supposed to eat this in haste. The the Israelites were to eat, it says in verse 11, in haste. That is, they're to gird up their loins like they're ready to walk. They're to have their sandals on their feet, a staff in their hand, and they're ready to go. And that's the way they're supposed to eat. So this is the, if if you'll allow me, fast food. They are supposed to eat in such a way that they are on the move. They are ready to go just as soon as it's time to leave. So there is nothing to be repeated here. Now, we need to look at verses 11 to 13 a little more thoroughly because here's the explanation. And this is what really is most important. The activities are important, but the words and the explanation is even more important. This is the Lord's Passover. Now that's going to be explained in the next two verses. Who is this Lord? Well, He is the Lord who is coming to Egypt. He is the Lord who is going to execute judgment upon the Egyptians. He's going to come and He's going to execute judgment against Pharaoh. He's going to execute His judgment against the people. He's going to execute judgment against or against or on all of the Egyptian gods. I am Jehovah. He is going to express His supremacy by showing His power over all of the Egyptians. He is going to come and execute judgment. But this is the Passover. He is going to come. He is going to pass through the land. And here's where the blood is so important. And here's where we get the explanation. Why put the blood on the door? Verse 13. The blood shall be a sign for you. A sign either to you of what has happened or a sign to you of what God will do to those who have been obedient and are under the blood, as it were, that's on the door. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live And God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will befall, will no no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God makes it very plain. That when he personally comes to execute judgment, he will look for the blood. And when he sees the blood, he will not bring judgment. A substitute has already died in that house. Now get this. Death comes to every house in Egypt. The question is, did it come to the firstborn or the substitute? And then God will pass over and not judge the house with the blood. Well, there's the unrepeatable sacrifice. A once for all sacrifice to be offered for the Israelites. Now, I say once for all sacrifice in the singular. There really was multitudes of sacrifices or multitudes of lambs that were killed. And I'd say sacrifice because that word comes later in the passage. Here, it's just merely the event being described. Those are the directives given for that unrepeatable event. But now in verses 14 to 20, there's a change. And we have directives for the repeatable memorial event. The repeatable memorial event. There is to be a celebration. Now this day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. 
And notice with me the duration of this repeatable memorial event. It is to happen perpetually. It is to be a permanent ordinance. A permanent ordinance is the word there is eternal to the vanishing point. It is to take place throughout the generations. One generation after the other is to engage in this. Now, I do want to highlight the fact that it's called an ordinance. And that word ordinance means law, statute. This was not optional. Just as they must sprinkle the blood on the doorposts, they are required to remember that event on a regular basis. And they're to do it for seven days. Seven days you shall not eat. There's a first day and the seventh day. There are seven, a whole week that is to be set aside. Time and again it says it in this section. And one commentator pointed out that this is probably due to the fact that a day comes and goes so quickly. And is easily passed. But when you surround it, with this event or follow it by this great event, two holy days, one at the beginning and one at the end, and a whole week of activity afterwards, it drags on, it, 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 it embeds it upon the mind. It increases the impact of the significance of this event. Remember, this event was to reorient their entire life as a community. So there's the duration of this ceremony. God sets it out very specifically, this repeatable memorial event. But then I want you to note the character of this ceremony. It is a memorial. That is, it is something that is to be a remembrance. We are to, they were to remember something. They were not to repeat something. They could not repeat the sacrifice in which God passed over. Every time they came to remember this and they made this Passover sacrifice, it was not going to be blood that would allow people to be passed over by the the judgment of God to pass over them. It was a remembrance of what God had already done in accomplishing their redemption in the sacrifice that had already been made. This was to be a remembrance, not a repetition. It was not going to be effectual for deliverance. It doesn't affect anything for the people participating in this memorial event. But it meant they were to bring it to mind. To constantly, frequently, or regularly bring this to mind that they might never forget what God had done for them. This was a memorial, but was also a sober ceremony. It was a sober ceremony. In this passage, in this section here, it talks about the unleavened bread. Now, we saw the unleavened bread, and before, in the unrepeatable event, the unleavened bread was due to the fact that they had to hurry. They didn't have time to do anything other than just take their unleavened bread Love their unleavened dough and put it in their their baskets and put it on their backs and out they went. We'll see that in just a minute. But the fact of the matter is, here now, this is to be something which governs a whole week of activities. They are not to eat any unleavened bread, anything with leaven in it. They are to purge out, to remove the leaven from their houses. So significant is this removal of the unleavened bread, that that becomes the name, as it were, for this whole week. They are to observe the unleavened, the feast of the unleavened bread. And so serious is it that anybody, and I believe the the right way to understand is, anyone who deliberately chooses to eat leavened bread will be cast out from the people. Why? Ever thought and think about that? Why leaven? Doesn't say. Well, there's all kinds of things, and we'll come to that in another sermon. But right now, up to this point in the history of the Bible, there's nothing that says leaven in itself is bad. But they are to remember that they ate this in haste. 
They are to remember and they are to be diligent to get rid of everything that would be leaven, all leaven from their house. And this is governed by holy assemblies, sacred days where the people of God gather together on the first day as a holy assembly and on the seventh day. On the first day when they have the sacrifice through that whole next week to the seventh day and no work is to be done on those two days. This is a very sober memorial occasion. There are the directives for the repeatable memorial event. Now, verses 21 to 23, those directives actually go on. But there's a little break in here because we come back to directives for the unrepeatable historical event. Now we come back and Moses is talking to the elders. Now notice before when Moses spoke to the people, when the Lord said for Moses to speak to the people in verse 2, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. On the 10th, they're still anticipating something in the future. Here, there's no anticipation. Go, take for yourselves lambs according to your families, and slay the Passover lamb. Now he's saying, it's time. This is the day. Go and do this. The leaders in Israel, the elders, were to take the lead. The blood is focused on here. There's the importance of the blood. And so there's specific directions given about using the hyssop, dipping it in the basin, spreading it on the doors, the blood of the lentils on the doors. This is what God will see. And then there's these words added. Do not go outside your home. Verse 22. None of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. Don't be found in God's presence, not under the blood. Just because you put the blood on the door, don't think now you're free to go out and do whatever you want. You stay in that house till God calls you to meet him. To meet God without the blood over you is a dangerous business. Well, then we come very quickly to verses 24 to 27, instruction regarding the repeatable memorial event with regard to The message. Here's the importance. What's this all about? Why have this event? Why go through all the trouble of cleaning out the leaven, sacrificing the lamb? Why are we going to do this? Here's the point. He emphasizes the message in verses 24 to 27. Follow along as I read. You shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And it will come about When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, that you shall observe this right. Notice, once you've received the promised land, don't forget how you got there. It began with redemption. And it will come about when your children will say to you, what does this right mean? Why are we doing this, Daddy? Why do we have to do this with all the leaven? Why do we have to take care of the lamb just that way? Why do we do this? You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. You see what's important? It's God's revealed message. Why is this? Because God chose to do this. Because this was the means by which God delivered us. By which God literally snatched us. This word means to be delivered. It can mean to snatch away from. It was by this means that God redeemed us. That God delivered us. Do you get it? That's what they were constantly to be telling their children every time they came to this Passover. We could have died with the Egyptians, but God snatched us away. But God delivered us. 
That's why we do this. To remember what God has done for us. My whole life, son, revolves around this event that God delivered me from the bondage in Egypt. That God saved us through this sacrifice, through this blood that was spread on the door. That God didn't come in judgment to us. Instead, He came in grace and snatched us. And that is the message that is to be passed on from generation to generation of Israelites. Now we come in the next section, in verses 29 to 42, to again a description of the unrepeatable historical events. I'm going back to the history again. I've entitled this section, Redemption Accomplished. Because here's the redemption, here's the exodus proper. Now, the Exodus comes in two parts. First, the impact on Egypt. Unbelief judged. You know, Pharaoh was a man of great faith. He really believed that God wouldn't come and judge him. He really believed that somehow this wasn't going to happen to him. But his faith was in the wrong God himself. And so he is judged a death blow to the vitality of his home and his dynasty and the homes of every Egyptian. The firstborn died in every single home from the throne to the dungeon and even the cattle in the field. They were judged. But the impact upon this in Egypt was even more. They were humbled. They were humbled. There is, a, there is a complete and unconditional surrender by the people of Egypt at this point. Look at how they respond. Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And it must have been some, something must have happened. They must have died in some sort of loud noise or, or something because everybody wakes up. And they all know that somebody has died. And every single house knows this. And Pharaoh arises in the middle of the night and all of his servants. There was a great cry throughout all Egypt. There was no home that was not touched. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night. No waiting. I'm going to wait till morning. Not going to go out to the river and hope he's there. I'm going to deal with this now. Call him. He had banished him the last time he spoke to him. You don't think that's humbling for this great, powerful king? Oh, yeah, that guy I banished and said I don't want to see him, and the next time I'd see him, I'd kill him? Send for him. And then he comes, and Pharaoh gives all of his full compliance to Jehovah's demands. Go! Get out! You, your sons, go worship God! Take your animals! And bless me also. Now, whether that's just pure sarcasm or whether that's really a humbled spirit that says, you know, this God really is who he says he is. The point is that they're they're utterly humiliated before God. All of his boasting, all of his, his power has been utterly decimated. And he is humbled before God when God comes to him. And then finally, Egypt is plundered. Egypt is plundered. The sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. They had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So they let them have their request. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. What's the impact on Israel? Well, it's faith rewarded. The promises are fully fulfilled. They are completely delivered. Everybody leaves. 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. 
Now notice in verse 41, it says, All the hosts, if you have the New King James, the armies of the Lord went out. Or they went out as an army. It may be indicating that the 600,000 are only the men 20 years old and upward who are able to fight in the army. At Mount Sinai, there's 600,000, three, 550, 603,550 males 20 years old and upward. There are probably over 2 million people that leave Egypt. And they all leave together. And there's even a host of Egyptians that go along with them, a mixed multitude that come along with flocks and herds. They evidently catch a vision of something here. Well, wow, these, these people are something special. We better go with them. And it's all done right on time. That's the, that's the emphasis of verses 40 to 42. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. The promise made to Abram in Genesis 15, 13 is that after 400 years of being enslaved and oppressed, they would be set free. So right on time. You say, well, there's 30 years difference. That can be taken into account in a number of different ways. But you try to do something 400 years out and make sure that you're not within 30 years. It's a pretty good margin. The fact of the matter is round numbers used in the scriptures don't undermine the authority that this is right on time. It's right when God wanted it to happen. It says, on that very day, verse 41, meaning they all came out together. None were left behind to leave the next day or the next week. There was just one massive leaving. All the Israelites left. And then I would have you note, who delivered them? Verse 39, they were driven out. The Egyptians got rid of them. Verse 41, no, all the hosts of the Lord went out. They left themselves. No. Verse 42, it is a night to be observed for the Lord, having brought them out from the land of Egypt. This was God's doing. He accomplished his promised redemption through the means that he had established. He historically delivered them. Redemption accomplished for his people. And then in verses 43 to 49, directives concerning the repeatable and memorial event. The last little bit we have here at the end of the chapter is who then can participate in this ceremony and this ongoing feast. Because you see, the, the, the thought is, well, those Egyptians, oh, they're bad people. This is just for the Israelites. Well, there's a sense in which it is just for the community of Israel. Notice verse 47. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. They are the ones who are to engage in this. No foreigner, verse 43. No sojourner or hired servant. No permanent visitors. And no hired uh, worker around the house unless they're spiritually joined to the covenant community. Unless they're circumcised. Every man's slave purchased with his money after you have circumcised him. Verse 48, if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. But no uncircumcised person may eat it. The same is true for the native and for the stranger. The Israelite who's not circumcised, he may not partake of this. He has not joined himself to the covenant community. The stranger who has not circumcised himself, he may not partake of this. But those who are circumcised, those who have the marks of the covenant community, they may participate. Well, I made it through the end of the chapter. Now, what lessons can we learn? Now, I realize I've covered a lot of material. I realize you're going to have to go back and read over that. I want you to catch these realities. Here is the number one lesson I am convinced that is being taught by this passage. 
faith. Believe. Believe God in what He says. Take Him at His word, regardless if you can understand why, regardless if it seems like it comes out of left field. Take God at His word. Notice how Israel's faith is is highlighted in this passage. As I mentioned, this is the first time Israel has been required to do something in order to avoid being taken in the plague, in order to avoid the plague. Now they have to do something. They didn't have to do that before. And this is a very strange, seemingly unrelated action. How do these activities associated with the Lamb have anything to do with avoiding destruction from God when He comes? You just try, just think about it for a minute. You just try and say, well, you know, I know God's coming, so I'm going to sprinkle some, some blood down here, and that will somehow keep Him out. The blood of a lamb is going to keep the omnipotent God from coming into me? If He says so but only if he says so. The meaning of that blood, the effectiveness of that blood, was not in the blood itself. It was in God's giving it value, establishing it as that which was acceptable to him so that he would not come in judgment. God's revelation was essential. Now remember, there had been nine other plagues. None of those had yet been effective in delivering them from Egypt. Now God says this is the last one. I say you put all those things together and I think the emphasis of this passage is these people had to exercise some pretty heavy duty faith. Who's been standing for God up to this point? Who goes and stands before Pharaoh and speaks the word of God to Pharaoh? Who is standing on God's side? Up to this point, it's only Moses. Moses and Aaron are the only two in this passage talked about as standing for God or standing for God before, the, before Pharaoh. Now, God calls all of his community to exercise faith and stand for him. That's why I skipped over some of the statements. You noticed that. But let's just look back at a few of the statements that I skipped. Verses 27 and 28, the end of 27. When the people hear of these directives, the people bowed low and worshipped. They humbled themselves before God. They worshipped this God who had given them these directives. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Notice again the last two verses of the chapter. Then all the sons of Israel did so. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And it came about on that same day that the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. They believed and they manifested their faith in God by acting upon his word as he had directed. Now, I've saved the ace in the hole here as to how I know this is faith. I have revelation that proves that. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. Hebrews chapter 11, speaking primarily of Moses. But Moses, with regard to this Passover, which I believe then would apply to all of God's people. Primary lesson here. Is faith. Hebrews eleven twenty seven we read, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Moses saw what Pharaoh could not see. God is real. And seeing that, by faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them. 
God was calling His people to take a stand upon His Word. Exactly what He had told them to do, nothing more, nothing less. Stand upon My Word, act upon My Word, stand for Me against the tide. Stand for Me in the way that I have described for you to stand. Exercise your faith and show your faith by obeying my commandments. What an act of faith. An amazing act of faith these people exercised. And they were all preserved. They were preserved from the judgment of God. Judgment didn't come to their house. Remember, Israel is God's firstborn. And Israel was delivered. Israel was preserved. As one man put it, biblically there was nothing special about what they did. For this is what faith is. Not a leap in the dark, but a leap into the light. There was darkness in abundance. All the misery engendered by slavery that had become even more deeply established. But in the darkness shone the proved beam, the proven beam of the word of the Lord. And that is the crucial point. Faith is action taken on evidence driven by conviction. The evidence was the demonstrated trustworthiness of the Lord's word. Verified in the course of nine acts. And the resulting conviction was the holding fast to that trustworthiness and believing that the Lord was able to do what he had said he would and his promises would stand. And the evidence of that faith was obedience. Now, it's a pretty elaborate story to te teach us that lesson. But that's the lesson that I believe it were to be were to learn from chapter 12 of Exodus. Stand upon God's word. Believe. Believe his word. Whatever he says to us, stand upon it, whether it makes logical sense or not. Don't stand upon it. Don't say you're going to stand with God because you can't come up with a better plan. Don't believe just because it sounds more pleasant than the other options. Believing is not just hanging around God's people. Believing isn't just standing back and watching everything take place around you. Believing is taking God at His word and casting yourself upon that word and expecting God to act as He has promised to act. Cast yourself solely and completely upon God's revealed means. Do not just subtract from them. Don't add to them. Don't tell me that you believe in God while you're not willing to act that faith out as he tells you to. Let me just think of a couple of examples as I wrestled with this. We heard this morning, the men got, got it this morning, husbands love your wives. Well, how about the other side of the coin? Wives, be submissive to your husbands. You know what? I could just imagine a woman saying, I don't understand why I must submit to this unreasonable, brutish man. Why must I submit to this lazy sluggard of a being? Because God says so. You know, the Bible says I'm supposed to win him without a word. I'm supposed to be silent with his unbelieving husband. Or maybe it's not quite unbelieving, but he's certainly not the husband he ought to be. And I'm supposed to somehow see that change without a word. I'm supposed to exercise faith in God and believe that God will actually save my husband if I never say anything. Don't you understand? He ignores me when I don't say anything. At least when I nag him, he listens. That's not faith. Faith says that you are to have a chaste and quiet spirit. 
and that he will be one without a word. Go back to what we heard this morning. You know, if you listen to society, I don't understand how the rod can unbundle foolishness from the heart. I don't understand how that works. As a matter of fact, aren't there a bunch of people that we could name who were disciplined biblically, lovingly, all their lives growing up, and yet they turned out rotten? That doesn't work. Faith says, God said it. I have no other choice. But society says that won't work. And you know what? I hear my kids telling me what society says. They say, I hate you when I go to spank them. Society's right. No, society's not right. God said in the book of Proverbs, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. If you spare the rod, you hate your son. Faith. If you're a believer in God, exercise faith by doing what he has called you to do as a parent. How about this thing called prayer? Come on, that really doesn't work, does it? I mean, I've prayed many times and I've not gotten what I asked for. God says, seek the Lord while he may be found. He says, seek, ask, knock. You shall find, he shall give, and you shall answer. He says, cast your burdens upon him, knowing that he cares for you. Well, I cast my burdens, and I don't feel any different. Doesn't matter. God says this is the way he's given us prayer for dealing with anxiety, for dealing with those burdens. He's given us this means. About sanctification. How can the word actually change me? I've read this book for going on 30 years now. And I'm still a sinner. It doesn't work. He says that Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. We have no other hope but that he actually will fulfill his promise and use the means that he has given us. Brethren, we need to be men and women of faith against all the tide, against all of the the opposition, against all of the uncertainty. This is what God has called his people to do. He did it there in Exodus. He did it with Abram. He's done it time and time again throughout the Gospels. You hear, believe, believe, believe. This is what God calls us to be, men and women of faith. And you see, as he weaves this together, this history and this redemptive ceremony, what he's telling us, I've given you something to encourage and strengthen your faith. Don't despise it. I've given you memorials to remember me by, to remember my redemptive work. That life of faith is a life which is reoriented around this event called redemption. Have you been redeemed? Were you born again? Then that's got to be central. That's, as it were, almost the first day of your life. And everything needs to revolve around that. Everything is reoriented to the fact that Christ has redeemed you. Christ has set you free. Are you living as though this is central? And don't despise coming to the table and remembering how he did that for you in his sacrifice of his son. Rejoice in that. Delight in that. Look to that. Remember that event. Well, my time is gone. There's much more that could be said. But let me just end with this brief comment to those who have faith, but not in Christ. 
There's not a person in this room who's not a very strong believer. The question is, what are you believing in? And what you're acting upon will tell me what you're believing in. And if you're acting upon your own self-will and not the revelation of God, if you're acting upon your own self-pleasure or self-preservation rather than the Word of God, then you are not a believer in Christ the way He defines it. You're a believer in something else, a believer in self, a believer in pleasure, a believer in this world. But there's a day in which you will be a believer in God, and it's the day you meet Him. And you'll either meet Him by faith in this life and humble yourself before Him now, or you will meet Him in the afterlife, and you will be humbled then. But then it will come with judgment and plunder, and everything you thought was so good and so important will be gone. Now, I've preached an awful lot of fear from this passage because it's a fearful passage. God walks through Egypt and people die. But the fact of the matter is, that's not enough. It's not enough just that you tremble in your boots that you're a sinner who's going to meet God one day. You must apprehend the mercy of God in Christ. There is a way for you to be delivered so that you can meet God and be safe. You must be under the blood. You must be under the blood of Christ, which Christ himself laid down his life that you might be set free. You must see the love of God in Christ. How does he show his love to sinful man? He sent his son into this world to die for sinners. That's how he shows his love to sinful men. See there how great is your sin. See there how great is his mercy. For he has made a way for you. And I say again, you must believe. You must cast yourself completely and solely and wholly upon him and upon him alone. And there's redemption in Christ. Abundant redemptions in Christ. Out of fear, go to Christ. Out of love, go to Christ. But you must Go to Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we plead with you that you would strengthen the faith of your people, that we would take you at your word, we would believe every line of it, we would obey it entirely. Where we fall short, we would draw ourselves up and we would ask for forgiveness and seek your face once again for grace to be obedient to your word. Help us, O oh God, strengthen our faith in Christ. Strengthen our faith in your word. And Father, we plead with you that you would also weaken the faith of those who believe in anything other than Christ. Shake their faith this night. Show them Jesus Christ, that they might flee to him. May they see your mercy in Christ and be safe by going to him in repentance and faith. Lord, please hear our prayers. We offer them to you in Jesus' name. Amen.